So ignore the fact that this is nothing like it might be saw on the website. So we're going to be the same thing. I'm just being lazy and didn't change my slides. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm the head of UX at Scott Logic, and I'm going to talk about something mildly UXy, but not really. Um, I'll try not to talk about users at all, um, just to find myself up. Um, what I wanted to talk about is kind of uh, data visualization becoming increasingly important in, in all our work. You'll like it, it's kind of cool. Um, and there's loads of people that are talking about how we should do things, you know, make a line chart or make something pretty or this or that. Um, and, and what bugged me was no one ever explains why data visualization works. Why is it that data visualization is such an effective way to communicate about large volumes of data as opposed to just having a table of numbers? Um, so I did some research, um, and this is kind of a summary of the stuff I found out. Um, before I go into any of the details, I'm going to start with a story. I've, I've shamelessly stolen this story from a book. Don't read the book, it's really boring. The story's great. Um, so this guy, John Ravatinov, who um, is kind of famous-ish, if you know your old, old sort of do-it-alls from the uh, sense of the 18th century, uh, he inspired part of one of the Gulliver's Travels books and did all sorts of cool stuff. Um, what I'm going to focus on is he wrote a paper um, arguing for divine providence using statistics, obviously. Um, and the statistical method's interesting. Uh, if you want to read the paper, go ahead and worry yourself with that. It's on Wikipedia. Um, but what I want to pick out is actually the data that he uses in this paper. Um, he actually presents it in one long table rather than split like this, but that's almost exactly what you see in his paper. <coughs> so, as I suggest, this is Christians in London and split into male and female over just short of 100 years. Um, this is, back in the day, this is how you present data like this. You see all the numbers, and when we're looking at it, we can see rough patterns. You can kind of see at the start that it's yeah, fives and four thousands, and it starts to go down a bit to some three thousand ish, and it starts to go up towards the end. Um, but that's kind of all we can see. Oh, I can maybe also see that roughly the relationship between male and female stays the same. Um, but that's all we're seeing. Now, back in those days, the idea of visualizing data was um, almost non existent. It was only later in the uh, 1700s that uh, William Playfair came along and kind of did the first real effort at it. Um, but I am going to plot it. This is something they didn't do. So this is what it looks like. Uh, that shape I just said about goes down and it comes up. Well, you can see that here. Um, but when we visualize it, you can also start to see other possibly interesting stories in there. What's, why do we have a big trough? What are all these little spikes and then troughs that are going on? Um, just to save you a bit of effort, that's some of the reasons for them. You know, uh, Civil wars are pretty good at wiping out people. Um, I guess they may also not be quite in the mood for creating babies. Um, that's just supposition. Plagues don't help. Um, all sorts of things going on. But there's this freaky bit at the end that you spot when you're looking at the visualization here. What's going on there? Surely there's something interesting. I couldn't find anything. Um, so I used what you can do with visualization. So well, I'll look at the numbers. Right, so that's roughly their values. And the bit that jumped out at me was that. They seem to be roughly the same numbers. Uh, what's going on there? And the visualization, I can't, I can't work out anything more from the visualization other than they, they're probably roughly the same numbers. So if we go back to the actual data set, it's starting to look a little bit iffy. Those numbers are identical. What the hell's going on there? Um, now, I looked up uh, John Rothman's original source of data, which was a guy called John Grohl. Um, and that the 1704 numbers are wrong. This is one of the original copy and paste errors. Um, but it's not spotted. If you go look at his, his peer reviewed published paper, it has that copy and paste error in it. Um, it jumps out at you when you plot it on a chart, but when you just look at the numbers, I'd be very surprised if any of you had spotted that for that previously read before you book the story. Um, so that's, to me, is a good example of why data visualization is so powerful. You, you can see shapes and patterns. Um, but where it falls down is when you're actually dealing with the absolute numbers, it's not so powerful for that. Um, so story over. Uh, I have to start with this because it's always bad to talk about data visualization without some kind of understanding of my definition, because people do have different definitions of it. Um, I, I use Stephen Fuse. You'll hear me reference it quite a bit in this talk. Um, it's the idea that you know, anything visual representation to, to um, try and understand data, but also 
tell stories using data. That's what we use data to provide you for. Uh, most people deal in one side or the other and tend not to do both the kind of the analytical side and the stories telling side. Um, but it's useful for both. Um, and here's what I'm going to talk about, obviously, with the data visualization audience. I have to do these, I'm so never going to stick to these timings, but it's roughly the order. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of kind of high level psychology almost. Um, then we're you know, cycling through a bit of kind of visual perception stuff um, before getting to something where you might actually learn how to do something. Uh, so it's all, the first chunk is all just background theory, and that's to me the interesting bit, but not very useful. So I'll we'll start with <coughs> um, Does anyone recognize that string of words? Um, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, right, um, you can go to sleep now. <laughs> so, um, here's a picture. I hope you can spot that she's probably an angry lady. Um, your gut instinct is probably that there's a loud noise associated with whenever that picture was taken, and maybe some aggressive movement. Yeah. Uh, that's really quite a sophisticated interpretation of what amounts to um, some projected pixels on the screen. Uh, but you didn't have to think about it. It wasn't conscious effort. You just got there straight away. Now contrast that with this. Um, I'm guessing immediately everyone goes, oh, it's a multiplication, and I probably could work it out. And because of the audience here tonight, a disproportionate number will actually bother to work it out. <laughs> Anyone want to care? Shout. Oh, come on. 408. I don't even know how to put it like that. It's how we're kind of going for the calculator. Um, but that, that sort of immediate impression of I can spot what's going on, I can spot what's being asked, that was identical to the picture of the angry lady. We didn't have to think about that. We had to put conscious thought into trying to work out what. You didn't put conscious thought into actually working out the multiplication, but you should. Um, and so these are, these are two systems, as Daniel Kahneman, who wrote the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, to shout out about. Um, these are kind of categorized two systems. You've got system one, which was that we can immediately spot things and interpret um, fairly complex data with that much conscious effort, but then other exercises take a lot of conscious thought. Um, and he kind of characterizes these systems, and I put them into silly pic pictures of people. So um, system one is always active, totally loves doing things all the time. System two is conscious thought. It's the laziest bastard around. Um, it's more like me. Uh, the other one is like my little boy who just will not switch off. Um, the other kind of difference here is that system one sneaky. It just kind of hangs around doing things. Where system two is very, very slow. It, it, that takes a lot of effort and it takes time to actually get it to do anything. Um, the last bit is that system one is relatively stupid. Um, it just goes through quick answers and tries to think about whatever you know, whatever's relevant. But sometimes people talk about the priming effect, um, where you know, if you've seen a picture of something in evil advertising, normally you're kind of primed to be susceptible to buying that thing. It's bollocks. But that's playing on the uh, system one type of thing where it's, it's been set up in your mind, the system one races towards it. Uh, system two is smart. It, we can look up old memory, we can do calculations like we saw earlier. Um, and it's also controlled. Um, so we, we can consciously switch it on and off. Um, system one you, is, is there whether you care about it or not. Um, for a much better explanation, well, that would be done by kind of the book. It's kind of terrifying. Um, but what, why this is relevant to data visualization is um, we want to try and get as much of an effort visualization into system one. If we can get our data to be interpreted by our brains without conscious thought as far as possible, then our conscious thought can really try and work out what the hell's going on or why is it relevant to me or anything like that. Um, so if we design our charts or whatever visualization badly, we're putting too much effort into uh, system two. You have to put conscious thought in, and as I demonstrated earlier, most people don't bother with that. Um, and same with system mind. So, crash, that was a crash course in high level psychology. Um, the next bit is so, how do we get the information into people's minds? In particular, why visualization? Why not you know, sound or, or touch or something like that? Because the way we get information into our minds is through our senses. Um, well, here's a visualization I stole from David McCandless. Uh, and this is the, it's based on data from the, someone else gathered, but it's, it's bandwidth into our minds for our different senses. Uh, so the big blue box on the outside here is, is sight. 
and we've got touch and smell and hearing and lips. And this tiny little white box in the bottom, that's our actual the bandwidth into our conscious mind. That's, that's the stuff that we recognize is coming into our head, um, where that's all the stuff that is actually happening without you being aware of. So sight is this vast amount of information coming into us. Um, if I present it like this, it's the same data, just a little bit easier to compare and contrast. You can see here how drastically more information is going through sight than any of our other senses. So it seems like a pretty obvious one to go for. Um, but this is into our unconscious. What about our conscious mind? Well, this sight still wins out, actually. Um, I've slightly punched around with the scales here. This is millions of bits. So we have roughly 10 million bits per second is coming in through sight. Um, 40 bits, not million bits, 40 bits is coming in through sight into our conscious mind uh, per second. Um, so it, it wins out, although it starts to lose out to sound a little bit. Um, but what's fascinating here is, is this vast amount of information coming into our unconscious, our system one, is being distilled down to something pretty minimal for our system two. Now if we want to get the data visualization right, we kind of want to work out what the hell's going on between these two. How can we best manipulate um, the data that's coming into our subconscious so that the right stuff comes into our conscious mind? Uh, let's find out. Um, what I'm going to go into next is to, to see how um, that fits into our visual perception. So roughly, we know how we see things, or well, where does it become system two from system one? Um, we'll jump through that quickly. Hopefully you all realize that we see things by light coming into our eyes and falling onto our retina. Not too controversial. Um, but that information falling onto our retina goes into massively parallel circuits into what's called iconic memory, um, which is really short-term buffer, just a seemingly short-term buffer, but it gives us a sense of a world. If we didn't have this buffer, we would, we, we would just see a tiny snapshot of things going on. We wouldn't have this full depth of vision as well. Um, but iconic memory is a little bit more than just buffering all the information together. It starts to try and enrich it with um, you know, pattern recognition and a bit more information than just, oh, look, uh, there's a thing over there. Um, it starts to try and find what I'm calling features, edges of shapes, um, rough colors and relationships between things. Um, it also tries to find rough patterns that are going on. Uh, this is really low level information, but it is starting to try and enrich it, to start to try and clear our brain as to where it might be of interest or not. Um, that information goes from iconic memory into visual working memory, uh, which is another short term buffer. If you can't remember things for long, think of it as RAM. Um, you might have heard people talk about how we can keep seven plus or minus two things in our mind at any given point. That's working memory as a whole, visual work memory is the same. It's really, really limited as to what we can do. That's why it's being seen with more than just rules from my point of view. Um, in the visual working memory, then we're trying to build up what are called objects. Um, so maybe my eyes have seen the head of a dog, but my visual working memory then starts to draw in uh, probably roughly shapes around this, you've probably got some legs. That's why it's a bit of a surprise if you see a three-legged dog or sometimes you don't spot it first time. You're expecting a leg, it's not there. Um, but it also builds up more information than just a visual thing. It starts to create associations. So it goes, well, it's probably a dog. Um, dogs are loyal and they're usually pets and usually friendly and they're usually furry. That's kind of extra information in there. Um, but it's not a universal thing. It, it's very different for different people. So. I know, for example, this used to be my pet dog, and he was called Barney. Um, the word, the name Barney, I kind of disassociate from a purple dinosaur. So every time I look at my dog, I think of a purple dinosaur. I did look at the rest in peace, poor Barney. Um, <laughs> that's how our brain works. It's a very associative thing that's going on. Um, wondering now where this information comes from? Well, it comes from our long term memory, our big storage bank of information. Um, and there's this sort of cycle of going on here, where visual working memory is trying to find things from the long-term memory, the long-term memory is trying to see things into the visual work memory, and it's just a big hodgepodge of things going on that no one yet fully understands. Um, so I'll explain that. Uh, but as a, a general principle, what I've talked about where with light coming in and kind of is bottom-up processing, that's, that's purely trying to react from what's going on. The top-down processing that's coming in here um, is trying to control um, the other way, we're trying to manipulate what we're seeing. Um, 
and I'm explaining this very poorly, so I'll, do, I'll try an example here. Now, if I'm out on the street with a big mass of people, um, and I'm trying to find my friend, uh, I call him Angus. Uh, and Angus is very tall, and Angus is ginger. Um, from, I work up in Scotland, so all my friends are tall and ginger. Um, and when I'm looking out over this crowd, uh, my long-term memory, this top-down processing, this, this kind of tall, the iconic memory, the visual working memory, ooh, ginger is particularly interesting, and tall is particularly interesting. So as I cast my eye over a crowd, anyone that's tall, anyone that's, or anything that's orangey, gingery, will jump out to me much more than everything else, because uh, top-down processing is trying to get me to look for that. But top-down processing needs the bottom-up processing to give it the information first. It's a mess, I can't even explain it very well. Um, but why we need both of these sides is yeah, we need to deal with ambiguities <coughs> like this. It's my crappy handwriting. Um, yeah, what's that symbol in the middle? Depends on which way you're reading it. Um, that's the fun you can have when you mess around with, with visual description. Um, or you just, your teachers start to rip into your handwriting when you're a young age and you never forgive them for it. Uh, so, it's fairly obvious roughly where System 1 and System 2 come into play with their visual perception. Roughly speaking, the iconic memory is these basic shapes and patterns of System 1, uh, and System 2 is kind of the more uh, associative stuff, um, trying to pick out, actively, consciously think through things. It's, a, it's blurry, um, because all these concepts are fairly abstract, and they're not necessarily mapping onto concrete part of your brain. Um, I'll leave it. Um, so, as we mentioned before, we're trying to put as much of the data visualization into System 1 as possible and try and keep System 2 as free as possible. So, what are these things down here? There's a general term for these features, and that's pre-attentive attributes. The name's pretty obvious as to what they are. They're things that attributes that are recognized before we attend to them. Um, and that's where we want to try and see as much put as much of our, our data visualization information into it as possible. Um, just to give you an idea of why playing around with great end attributes is so powerful, um, <coughs> again, stolen from Stephen Fuber. Try this in the last class. How many fours are there in that sequence of numbers? Somebody that's good as the multiplication number. Okay. It's a tough go. Four. Oh, 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 oh. Six. Right. I'll now play with the pre-attentive attributes. Um, how many fours are there in the sequence of numbers? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, could, I, can, I can totally cheat here, but I'm not highlighting one, and it's entirely possible I've done that by accident. Um, but the moment you present the numbers <coughs> like this, well, I can play with pre-attentive attributes, and I've suddenly made your whole task a lot easier. Um, so that's what we want to do in theory with data visualization. We want to support the story, the task that we're trying to tell, uh, the story we're trying to tell, the task we're trying to support. Um, so, how, let's do some cool stuff. How can we actually do this thing? I've got theory out of the way. Um, in data, there's kind of two aspects of data that are of interest at any given point. One is values, um, so zero is it, whether it is it, something else. And the other is relationships, how do these numbers relate to each other, how do we group them in instruction. Um, so, I'll look at the two different sides separately, uh, there, otherwise it gets messy. So, first of all, values, and then particularly quantitative values, and by that I mean anything number on a scale or any value scale. Um, so there's a guy Colin Ware and a lot of research and he, he starts to pick out pre-attentive attributes, specific things we can we spot way before they get to our conscious mind. And this is but a small handful of them. There are loads and loads and loads. Um, but any of these little attributes differentiate something from another. So orientation, this one looks different to all the others. We see that immediately. Um, the shape, this one jumps out of us, is different. Um, but interestingly with values, we need to actually get something we perceive quantitatively, something where we get an idea of <coughs> less or more. Um, you know, is a circle more or less than a line? Um, you'd have to tell me, I don't know that naturally. Um, so there's only four of these that are actually, there's, there's one or two I must have that are a little bit weird, but these are five, um, are the main ones that, that can be perceived um, quantitatively. So, you know, a thicker line is more than a thinner line. Um, a bigger blob is more than a small, smaller blob. All these kind of things are in there. Um, but actually, Colin Ware's uh, investigations went further, and he found that a 
there's only two of these that are actually very accurate, where we can say fairly closely, yes, this is more or less by a certain amount. So a line length. We can fairly easily say that that one is roughly three quarters the size of the other. Three or four or three. Um, can't really say that with something like line width. You can, it, it starts to get very vague. We start to um, you know, start watching. Um, so when we're designing visualizations, if we're trying to put numbers in, these are the kind of attributes we can go to. If we want something to be really precise and be able to compare two values really accurately, line length would work, 2D position would work. Um, 2D position is a weird one. Um, despite uh, all you know, the left to right, right to left cultures, um, a lot of research has shown that up and to the right for all cultures is considered more, um, which is kind of surprising to me. I like, suspect it would be the other way around for that, uh, for right to left cultures, but it's not the case, supposedly. Um, so that's, that's, this is kind of an abstract thing, but can we, how do I turn this into a tool for you to actually do something useful with? Um, well, there were two guys, uh, you know, there was a group of people in the 80s, surprisingly, um, Cleveland and McGill, and they did a lot of research around trying to compare visual attributes and how good they were for comparing things. Um, and this is kind of roughly a scale they came up with. Um, so they're saying that in their research, if, if you do 2D position along a common scale, which is essentially what length and the like amounts to, that's far more accurate than any of these other ways of visualizing the information. You can make very, very, with a slope, for example, I can say that slope is more or less, but the accuracy of how much more or less diminishes. Um, it's a bit clearer when you go through some examples. Uh, so here's a bar chart. I don't think anyone could argue about which is the biggest one here, or which is the smallest one, or how they all compare. You can see that. In fact, if, if you put these within a pixel or two of each other, most people can still spot the difference. Um, and that can be you know, a, a fraction of a difference in the actual value. So when you're doing something very, very analytical, if you're building a tool that is um, where those tiny fractions and differences in numbers makes all the difference. You really want to be going with something that is at the top of the scale, not down the bottom. Um, line charts are another example that are used like that. They're very analytical, but the, the points um, are all the 2D position along common the line scale. Um, but a line chart adds in slope as well. Slope's actually far down the scale, but it still has a useful added extra here because I can say that well, this, this slope here looks a bit steeper than the one there. Couldn't tell you by how much, but it does look steeper. Um, sometimes that can be a useful comparison. Um, now to everyone's favorite, or my least favorite, as it's called known, pie charts. Um, so pie charts encode their information using a combination of angle and area. Um, the area thing's a bit of a weird one, is the side effect of it being encoded at an angle. Um, but for example, Tell me, which one's more, blue or red? I can guarantee you they're not the same number, but only by a small fraction. Um, no, couldn't tell you. I mean, you're all squinting. This is, this is a good example of why, one of the reasons why I think apply charts, not really for very analytical purposes, is great for, for less analytical purposes. Um, but if you're the task you're trying to support for people is comparing to um, values, this pie chart is not going to do it if the, diff the small differences matter. If it's vague, great, stick with it. Um, a last one just to show you this idea of, of how we can use these attributes. This thing's uh, a combination of a tree map and a heat map. Um, it's in, in my world of the finance stuff, it comes up fairly often. Um, so the tree map elements is the sizes of the blocks. Um, what they've done is the, the area of the um, rectangle represents market capitalization, which is a stock market thing, but the bigger the block, the bigger the company, roughly speaking. Um, and then the, these are nested, so you can see the technology is this rectangle, or financial, that's a big rectangle, so that's a bigger company than the stock exchange. Um, the color then is being used to say whether the stock price is going up or down, and the more intense the color, um, the better it's doing, or worse it's doing, depending if it's green or red. Let's look at all the things that are going on here. So first of all, the area. That's not very accurate. It's very hard to, to accurately compare some of these areas. And the same thing, it's smaller, but um, it's still pretty awkward. Um, we've also got uh, the color intensity going on, which is not the same level. So we can, we can kind of say this green is more intense than this green. 
Um, it starts getting in. Uh, what's the difference between those two? Yeah, it's tough, tough. Um, and then the other one, which is totally artificial, is the color Q. Uh, green is more, is good, red is bad. Um, that's totally artificial. I uh, apologize for any colorblind people, you may struggle to see that. Um, but that color Q is not a meaningful scale. There's no, other than um, cultural standards, there's no reason why green and red should seem to be more or less or good or bad. That definitely does differ in culturally, so it's a bad one to use. Um, so hopefully that kind of gives you an idea that this, this scale we've got on the right hand side of stuff like Peter McGill um, can really be useful when you can start from scratch. If you want to create some crazy new visualization, you can work out if you want to do something analytical or something that's a bit more just presenting some information nicely. You can pick off that scale quite easily. Um, the other element is and all we've done here is to be, to be able to compare values. It's all fairly abstract. We've not actually um, given anyone a way of reading off values. And unfortunately, that's why we have to bring in scales. There's no way of getting away from it. If you want to be able to, people to be able to read absolute values, you introduce scales. Um, and scales are not part of system one. They are they're the, the most acute end of system two. Um, but any form of reading, any numbers, that's a learned symbol. There's always an element to look up there on there. So when we were looking at the John R. Rothman example at the beginning, the first thing you saw was the shapes and how they relate to each other, and you did that comparison. You had to actually put effort in to start trying to read the numbers off for exact values. Um, sometimes you can leave scales off visualizations altogether when they're irrelevant, but people always ask for them. It's very normal. Um, right. Hopefully that's given you something about how we can encode values. We move over to relationships now, and relationships are split down into kind of this structure and grouping. If we can uh, produce some kind of grouping into our um, visualizations, then we're creating relationships to them. Um, some of those are tech presentative attributes we talked about earlier, earlier, like a cross or something. Um, that's a way to differentiate something. The one with the cross uh, was different to all the others. Um, that's a relationship we're creating there. Um, but instead of focusing on this individual pre-attentive attributes, I want to talk on, on a, a pattern approach. Um, this may be familiar to others as well. Um, but something known as the Gestalt Principles. So it was a, a school of psychology and they um, did a lot of research quite a while back uh, into how we perceive grouping. Um, and it's, there are a whole load of these principles and I'm just picking a handful that can be useful. But you should definitely, if you're interested in this, then work on finding out more about it. Um, I should add, they're very, very obvious once they're pointed out to you, but if you use them as a conscious tool, they're very powerful. Um, so one of the principle is the principle of similarity. And that's the idea that things that look the same, we naturally group. So in this cluster in the top left, the hollow <coughs> circles look like a different group of full circles. Ditto with all these other shapes here. Um, great, you're saying, well, what can we do with that? Well, here I've done similarity of color. And again, any apologies for anyone who has Colorblindness issues. Um, I can differentiate three series in this scatter plot just using color. And that's, that's the principle of similarity. <coughs> this is not rocket science, it's totally obvious, but it is something you should consciously think about. They can be used in very powerful ways if used appropriately. Um, you can really screw people over if you use it. Um, another principle proximity. I mean, obviously, things that are closer together are a group. Um, awesome. Right, well, I've used that here. And I've created four clusters, you hopefully all saw those four clusters, and then similarity created subgroups within that. And I'm starting to structure it, and actually it's all it's something you naturally perceived. I didn't have to put keys, I didn't have to put massive lines and arrows and boxes and things for you to read to understand that, you can just see it. Um, but you can use it more powerfully if you're using proximity. So here we've got two sets of squares, um, and the differences in spacings are, are a matter of pixels. But on the left, you see columns. On the right, you see rows. Um, that's pretty damn powerful if you start to blow that up something bigger. You can create all sorts of different relationships. Um, another principle, enclosure. This is the most obvious one, easy to understand. You draw a box around something, or you put a background on something. It looks like they're all grouped together. Brilliant. Um, hopefully, you don't have to explain it too much. Um, but when you combine this, there's another principle called uh, closure, which means if we see a partial shape, we, we finish it off. Um, it means you can, when we see this chart, we're not seeing sort of a, a shape that goes off into the nothing. Um, we see a sort of box here. You, you naturally fill in that side. 
Um, that's a couple of different principles playing together, but you can use that in, in again, in very powerful ways. Um, hopefully, I'll be aware of that in a minute. Um, the last one I was going to show you is connection. Um, so this is, this is that example where there's columns based on spacing, um, and that connects along the rows. So now you see rows instead of columns. Um, so I'm screwing around with different principles here. Connect, there's, there's been a lot of research to try and find out which of these Gestalt principles is the, the strongest, which one overrides the others. Um, it's all very inconclusive. Um, my personal take on it is that connection pretty much overrides everything. If you draw a line connecting things, it's about a stronger relationship that you can create. Um, and you see it endlessly in charts like this, um, which may not be very obvious to anyone on the back. That's, I think it's debt owed to various countries by other countries. But it creates the relationship between you know, Italy and Portugal owe each other some money. Great, that's useful. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll jump in all from this. Um, so, uh, I'll just go back a second. Okay. Uh, so, this is a bunch of uh, different result principles that create groupings for us. Now, groupings are one form of structure. The other really powerful form of structure that most people overlook um, is ordering. Uh, again, it seems really, really obvious, but nearly every time you're doing visualization, Questions of who's, you know, what's best or what's first or what's last or, or where am I in the rank is a very, very common thing to want to find out. Um, so think about it and add some kind of sorting in there to add structure to it. Um, I started with this. This was my story. Of, this is what I'm going to talk about. My order was the order of things I'm going to talk about. But if I sort those differently, <coughs> I order them differently, now the story is which one am I going to bang on about for the longest? Um, and all the differences there uh, is that order. But I've completely changed the story that I'm telling you. And you can, again, you can use this in different ways. If you're doing something interactive, letting people um, control the story is a very powerful way to let them try and find their own stories in the day. Um, so this, this ordering thing and those Gestalt principles can be combined in uh, powerful ways. Hopefully you can just about see this. Um, this is uh, a visualization that was done for the New York Times, and this form of visualization is becoming more uh, common. Um, but it's a scatter plot with a connected line through it. It doesn't sound that revolutionary, but you're seeing something pretty interesting here. So along the bottom, along the x-axis, um, is the miles driven per person in the States. Uh, along the y-axis is the cost per gallon of gasoline, or just gas, as we like to call it. Um, and so that would just be a random collection of blobs all over the place. But what Anna Perkill's done, by drawing the line through to give you the time sequence, so that we've got some 1970s at the beginning there, uh, and I think it's in 2010 when this was done, uh, is at the end. You start to see this weaker shape where it, it sort of it loops back on itself. Um, to the point where actually that became, that influenced the title of her article. Um, so she's used a basic scatter plot for something pretty analytical. So we can, we can really compare these points. This is a 2D location. We can uh, really see differences in them. But then she's used the Gestalt principle of connection to create an ordering. And um, this is sort of an example of all these different things coming together. Um, you can deconstruct what you start to look for. Um, I could show you a hundred more, more examples, but um, you, know, you have seen lots of examples. And you should maybe have a go at trying to consciously deconstruct some. Um, so, I want to show more. I'll just quickly recap. We kind of touched on what System 1 and System 2 are. The standard <coughs> kind of content, the stuff we perceive very quickly and very easily, and the stuff we put conscious effort into. And try to split that into roughly, in our visual perception, where, where's that, where, where's which bit. Um, and knowing which bit we were trying to look at, the System 2 versus System 1, these pre-attended attributes, we looked at, well, how can we encode values in those, and how can we encode uh, relationships with those. Um, and that's all I need to know, hopefully, to get started. Now, now you can go and read all the articles that tell you how to do this well, knowing this background information. Um, if any of this is any more interest to people, these are four books I very, very strongly recommend. Um, don't worry, the slides are on, on the interwebs, so you can get these all later. But uh, the Colin Ware one is, is very uh, tough going, um, but it's a fascinating book. He's, it's very hardcore theory about visual perception. Um, Information Dashboard Design by Stephen Few uh, has known as the hardcore, but he, his, that book is very relevant to what a lot of us need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is take as much data as possible and cram it onto a single screen. That's what that book's about. Um, 
The functional arts is where I guess the newspaper <coughs> is on and it's all in your graphics. So if that's your vote, go there. Design for information gets a little bit arty. Somewhere in that spectrum, hopefully something's mildly interesting. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, that's me. That's the slides. And actually, there's a sister article I wrote that covers all of the stuff I talked about with less examples um, that's here. Uh, maybe go and read it. It, it earns me nothing. Um, I wish it would, but no. Thank you very much for listening.